stratify the stratifieds and the simples, the squamosas, the cuboidals, the columnars, the transitionals, the pseudostratifieds. And then they said, but what do you want to keep your cells anchored to their neighbors? What would I use to do this with? And we're looking at what's known as cellular connections, otherwise known as intercellular, intermeaning between the cell connections. And we've got five major different types of intercellular junctions. My suggestion would be if I were a student and I would simply first memorize the names on this page. I don't have to know what they are. It's just bomb it in, bomb it out. Memorize the page first of all. All right, I've got tight junctions. I've got something called gap junctions, something called an adhesion belt, something called a desmosome and a hemidesmosome. And then I realized, oh, he has this bracket next to tight junctions called occluding junctions. Because one of your frustrations, understandably, I get used to it, is multiple names for the same silly thing. I will usually always try and tell you the more commonly used version of that multiple choice game, but you always want to be aware of the other version in case somebody doesn't use both names. When we looked at the idea of a tight junction, first, when, when I look at the diagram, and I'm going to be hounding you guys, all 241 and all 242, when John says, look, don't look, you look at the diagram, you study it and analyze it. And by doing that, I realized that tight junctions are located only in the upper portion of a cell. They're not found along the lower portions. So I can see that from this, right? They're only up here. They're not down there. They're not down here. All right, that's one thing to notice. Same thing for an adhesion belt. It's only in the upper portion, not along the lower portions. Now, and then I have to look at what the diagram is trying to show me. And what the author is trying to show me is, he's taking this little white box area and saying, let's zoom in on it over here. So there's my tight, and there's my adhesion belt. The tight junctions, I realize that this pink line, right, is actually the cell membrane of this cell, and this pink line is the cell membrane to this cell. So they're pinching two cell membranes together and using a protein to kind of staple them together. And we're going to call that a tight junction because it's to prevent material from passing between cells. That's its purpose. That's why it's called tight. Things can't squeeze through them. And it looks like a bead or a sewing machine went through and both cells are contributing to those proteins and they're just stapling the membrane together in these little regions and they're only found in the upper part. Then the idea of an adhesion belt. And as much as you can, let the words help you, right? Adhesion, adhesive, that means like sticking things together. Okay, and then what the hell is a belt? Well, for me, it's that thing that goes around my waist, all the way around my waist. It doesn't only start here and here. I got a belt that goes all the way around. This must be a belt-like structure that helps to stick cells together, and it goes all the way around the inside of my cell, and then I realize that both cells are involved in making the entire structure. Again, look, don't look. There's my cell membrane. That purple lump is the end, right? Because you're doing a cross section of it, of my adhesion belt. And there's the other side of it. So together, both cells are contributing to these little purple nail-like proteins that are protruding from the cell into the space between two neighboring cells like interlocking fingers, like this. So this hand contributes these fingers, this hand contributes these fingers. Now I have a way of kind of locking my hands together. And I'm going to fill the space with basically a biological glue. So there's a fluid in here that's like a glue, like cement. Sort of like mortar fills in the gaps of bricks. And what you want to notice is, right, this whole structure, right, is my adhesion belt and both cells play a role in making it, and it runs along the entire inside of that cell. Now the little red cable-like things, right, are intermediate protein fibers, which you should remember from my cellular or cytoskeleton idea, intermediate fibers. And I notice they span all the way across the inside of my cell, sort of like um, the net that capture, captures trapeze artists. Right? And that net is spanning the entire inside of the cell, like a spider web. It goes all the way across. And so the, inter the adhesion belt is formed by two cells. Right? They have these interlocking proteins, and of course that will prevent stuff from passing between them as well. But it goes all the way around the inside. 
that helps to anchor two neighboring cells side to side. Then we get to the ones that are called gap junctions. And I look, not look, I realize that gap junctions now are like these little nail-like structures that are found along various places on the sides. They're not found on the floor, and they're not found in the upper portion. They're found along the sides of my cell, and they look like this. Again, right, look, don't look. Cell membrane of one cell, cell membrane of the other. They're contributing to these proteins that are called connexons. And these connexon proteins form a tubular structure. And there's the end of it, right? So this end right here is that edge right there. And you can't see the tube-like idea, but this is the tube-like idea when you cut it lengthwise. Now, the benefit is, yes, like a tight junction, it does prevent material from passing between cells. They can't get past them. But if you look at a tight junction over here, literally, yes, it prevents things from passing between them, but it also doesn't do anything to let stuff pass from one cell to another. That's not a hollow little gray structure there. But in a gap junction, it's like a tight in the fact that it prevents stuff passing between cells. But the benefit is it allows substances to pass from one cell into its neighboring cell. So I can pass from one cell into another cell. That's why it's called a gap junction. It forms a gap between the two cells that allow the material to diffuse through that gap. And I can't do it with a tight junction. I can't do it with an adhesion belt. Then I look at the next one, known as a spot desmosome. The little purple dots here. There's one there, there's one here and here. Again, they're like gaps in the fact that they are on the side walls. Now, when I zoom in on them over here, right, because that's a gap junction right there, I look at this and think, wait, wait, I, I've seen that before somewhere. Where in the hell, where have I seen that? I'll go, well, it's not there. Uh, oh, there it is. That looks just like this, right? But the difference is, that's not a belt. It doesn't go all the way along the length of the cell. It's just a spot, like a button, like a nail. But it has the same basic structure, right? Each cell contributes to it. Like this cell creates these proteins that are known as sort of cell adhesion molecules, little purple nail-like things. And they're protruding out of the cell into the neighboring space. This cell makes the same type of proteins. Again, we're back to our interlocking fingers. But instead of being a belt-like structure that goes all the way around, it is just in one little spot, in multiple spots. Now, the way to envision this maybe is think about when you build a house or a room. And you have the frame of the room. Right? And then, what comes up after the frame? After you've inserted your insulation, what goes on top? Drywall, right? And how do they anchor the drywall to the frame? They nail it, right? You know the little nails you see at various parts of the drywall? Well, this looks like gypsum board, drywall. And those are my nails that hold the drywall to the frame of the house. It is a spot where the drywall is anchored to the wood. This is a spot where the cell is connected and anchored to its neighboring cell. It just uses the same idea as an adhesion belt, except for the fact that the belt does go all along the length of the sides of the cell. Like a belt goes all the way around my waist. This is a spot, right? It's not a belt, right? But that's a belt that goes all the way around. They're made of the same things. Now, that's a spot desmosome. The last thing I have to worry about is a hemidesmosome. And I realize, all right, where do I find hemis compared to spots, compared to gaps, compared to adhesion belts, compared to tight junctions? The big difference is hemis are only on the floor of the cell. I don't see them anywhere else because they're anchoring the floor to the basement membrane. And again, that kind of looks like a spot desmosome, kind of looks like an adhesion belt but it's just half of a spot desmosome, basically. And they interject their proteins into the basement membrane, so I can anchor it so that that cell won't slide around the basement membrane. Don't worry about the definitions and the subdivisions of the clear layer and the dense layer. This is just your basement membrane. We'll get more detailed if you need to in a um, other cell class.
Well, I find it on the inside of the cell, right? But then it protrudes its little finger-like proteins outside of its cell wall, right? Or out of its cell membrane. Okay, so it goes inside the cell membrane of both uh, cells. Well, and if you look at the picture, right? That cell is making those purple proteins. And that protein pointy right there came from this cell, but it passed through the cell membrane, and it's sticking outside the cell. Right? And this cell is making those purple proteins, and they're protruding. This is the inside of the cell. That's your phospholipid layer right there. That means that purple thing is actually protruding out of the cell. And so they're facing each other. Sort of like interlocking arms, if we want, or hands. And the ones are inside, all the way in, and it's both, both membranes, cell membranes. If both membranes are involved, yes. Okay. And it doesn't affect the occluded junction? Mm -mm. Won't affect them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if the components of the adhesion belt and the desmosome, the spot desmosomes are quite similar, yeah. how do uh, cell, cells distinguish between them? Like how do they design it differently? Well, one is simply just a, so I mean, the idea of a spot desmosome, if this is a columnar cell turned sideways, okay. right? We all go with that idea of a columnar cell turned sideways? Right, then this is the side of my columnar cell. The basic membrane would be this part right here. This is the basal layer. There's the apical layer. Turn it sideways. My spots would be found here and here and here. And then this would be the idea of my adhesion belt. Right, it's a continuous protein that runs along the entire length of all four sides of my cell. And how does it know to do this versus that? That's just the DNA of the cell itself. Remember, the DNA determines what cells do and how they do what they do. And it says, okay, if you're going to build me an adhesion belt, then you're going to do it like this, only in the upper part of the cell. But then to really reinforce myself stuck to neighboring cells, I might also include some gap junctions and some spot desmosomes as well. Because this is like, you're short of material. So I just use an abbreviation of this along with other parts. Otherwise, I could flip-flop. I could actually pull this part of the cell wall away with that. Okay, let's not get too hung up on the nitty gritties, right? First, memorize different kinds, and then really focus on the tights and the gaps, for sure. But I might ask about the other ones as well, but those are the two most important ones of those. All right, then keep in mind that the epithelial cells are cells that line the outside or inside of a structure, which means they're probably exposed to, to wear and tear and friction and abrasion, and then I need to replace them every once in a while. So we're going to use germinative or stem cells to do so. And those germinative or stem cells will be always located for sure on the basal layer and maybe even the one layer right above it perhaps sometimes. But nowhere higher because they have to be coming from the very bottom of those. How fast they do it can depend upon where we are in the body. All right? and we'll kind of learn those ideas of cell replacements when we go from system to system to system. It might be as much as every six hours or once in your lifetime. So it could vary quite a bit. All right. Now we've got to get to definitions and categories again, organizational ideas. If I were to do an autopsy on a person, and I've never done an autopsy on a person before, let's say I'm an alien, so it really wouldn't be an autopsy. Uh, it would be called a necropsy, actually. If I were to dissect a human being for the very first time as an alien, and I find organ-like tissues, so I'm going to say, well, after looking at all these different organ-like tissues, I realize I can put them in two just gigantic categories of glands, endocrine and exocrine glands. Now, let's look at the definition of how we define these and the anatomy of these various glands. Let's do this one on your anatomical lower right-hand side, which is actually be your left side of your screen. This is an exocrine gland. That's an endocrine gland. How do I know that? Because it says so right there. <laughs> okay. I mean, the obvious first, right? Look, don't look. What I'm trying to point out is a lot of the learning you can do on your own if you just pay attention to the slides. Let the slides talk to you. Now, what do I see about this? Well, purple cells here, purple cells there. Okay, that's nice. Yellow ones here, no yellow ones there. Hmm, so what's unique about this? There's a capillary or a blood vessel. 
And then the purple cells are what make the stuff. So let's look at an exocrine gland. The purple cells make whatever it is. Maybe it's saliva, maybe it's oil. They release their material by exocytosis into the lumen of their structure. This is a three-dimensional structure. So in a way to help me visualize this, think of this as an upside-down flower vase, where the flowers would go in this way, and the stems are sitting in here. So these purple cells form a ball-like structure that's hollow, and the ball-like cells and the hollow area of the lumen, we call that the acenus of my exocrine gland. And then there's a duct, a passageway from the lumen that leads to the surface of the structure. All right, the duct leads to the surface of the structure, whatever it is. Then I realize that my exocrine gland has two major parts. It has the acenus and it has the duct. I don't have either of those in my endocrine gland. Notice that where the material is made, right, is released by exocytosis and it goes into the lumen. It's not 